5.39. Well, good morning and welcome again to the uh, Faith Family uh, UCC uh, study in Luke. Um, we're still in what I call lesson four. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to have to redo the lessons and I'll put them on online um, so that they look like what we're doing. Um, we're right now, we're in uh, chapter 5, verses 33, and this is the Jesus question, the question about fasting. Um, we also see this in Mark uh, 9, 14, and then uh, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew 9, 14, and Mark 2, 18, where uh, others, John's disciples come, and they ask Jesus about fasting. Um, what's interesting, I thought, I, I thought this here it says, uh, they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. And Jesus answered. Um, I, I, one of the things that I noticed, I think, if, if we go back and look at the first five chapters, I think this is the first time that they address Jesus directly. They're always asking his disciples, or they're talking amongst themselves, and and this is this is this is where they finally got to the nerve to to kind of ask Jesus directly about about things. So, um, what do you think about that? Do you think that they're there that Jesus is is uh, moving them towards uh, more open mindedness? Um, that they can they can come and ask him these questions, whereas before the questions were kind of baited, and they were at the they were towards his disciples, or or what do you think about that? Do you understand my question? Is this the first time that he is is this, is this the first time that Jesus has uh, drawn a distinct line between the law and what he's teaching? I. Is this a con what he's saying is contrary to the law of, 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 the, of the Pharisees. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. The, now, that's kind of like what what we were what Peter was saying a little bit earlier before we get started. Um, this idea that what the Pharisees did was I like to call it building hedges. So so you got the law at the center, and so they know their law, and so they build a hedge around it. Okay, don't even go this far, and don't even go this far, and and so they build these these row of hedges, and then people that aren't always in the law, back then, you know, they didn't have a copy they could pull off their bookshelf or was sitting on their coffee table, um, so they just they just went to the synagogues and and the you know the temple and they were read the read the. But then they would expound on it just like we do today. They'd have little sermons on it. And those sermons would tell them, don't even do this and don't even do that. And, and Jesus, what he's doing is he's kind of breaking down those, those hedges and saying, here's what the law says, you know. And, and you see what I'm saying? So, so he's kind of like what you were saying, Peter. Don't tell me that I can't do this and this because that's not what the Bible tells us we can and can't do. That's what you've decided you won't want to do because you you know your own temptations and so you don't want to get close to it. Well, I thought what, what it was interesting is what he he compares himself to being the bridegroom at a wedding. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you have the the big cheese here, you you eat and drink. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Because sooner or later, it's going to be a, that's going to end. So he's kind of he's putting in his. He's calling. He's calling attention to himself as you know. Hey, you know, come on, you got, you got the, you got the guy here. So when you got the guy here, you eat and drink, um, and because that's not going to go on for forever. Exactly. Exactly. So, so what do you think? As as followers of Christ, should we fast? I'm sorry, say that again. As as being followers of Christ, should we fast now? Fasting can be an expression of your, of your, of your, of your, it can be a discipline of mm -hmm. your, uh, of your faith. Mm -hmm. I asked this question while we're right in the middle of Lent, by the way. 
<laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> Fasting's an individual choice. I don't, I don't think it's a. I mean it. Okay. From the Bible. Okay. I can agree with that. What about y'all? What do you think? Should we fast? It, it goes on to talk about not putting the new and the old. Um, yeah, the parable. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the the wine, you know, new wine and a dirty pitcher kind of thing. So yes, we should fast when we feel. We need to cleanse ourselves of, of the past. Do we uh, fast for 30 past. days? How long do you fast? How long do you fast? That's a good question. Well, I work for a 36-year-old who would fast for three or four days. And I mean, all he would drink is water, 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 water. You know what I'm saying to you? Mint conditioned body, exercise, go to the gym and everything, but not for religious purposes, just to health reasons that's the that's the question that we need to ask first what is yeah. fasting what's the purpose what are you doing what is the fasting what are you doing it for yeah. you know I, when I whenever I fast there's always something in the back of my mind that says oh yeah you shoot you're gonna lose a little weight too you know that that's like and so so a lot of people feel that way is it's not only it's not only um, fastest, you know, keep from doing something, but oh, I'm going to lose weight. Ah, uh, that doesn't work that way. But, well, they, they've got a new thing out now that, that says yeah. intermittent fasting right. is, is supposed to be good for your weight. Or food. five meals a day instead of three big Yeah, yeah. When big, I was, big, big meals. When know? I did when I did bodybuilding, that's what I, that's what I was doing. I was, I was, I would eat six meals a day. That's what home Every two, every two hours, I, I would eat Probably about 50, 50 grams of protein and some a little bit of carbohydrates. But you know, you you just constantly eating, and and believe it or not, <laughs> that becomes more of a challenge than going to the gym and working out. <laughs> going to the gym and working out was the easy part. The hard part was the fasting, putting all that food in your body so that you could recover from the workouts. But yeah. Um, yeah. But the question, going back to the question, the question mm -hmm. is, what is fasting and what is it for? Well, I, I don't think this is about fasting. Okay. At all. You don't think what? I don't think it's about fasting at all. He's using fasting as an example <clears throat> to show us that <clears throat> we're going to have to change from what we did back before I was born mm -hmm. to what you're going to think after I was born. You're not going to take the thoughts that I'm giving you and put them in the old wine skins that you oh, had that's before. Good. No, I mean, that's a good one. Right? I mean, if you read the whole thing. Yes, yes, yes. 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 It, it, you it, can't it, mix it. Yeah, I mean, he's not talking about about food. So, he, so it's you, the example. Not this, the, not everything's the a parable that they could understand. This so, so you're so you're suggesting that that he he politician them right here. In other words, they, no. he was given a question. And he directed the question from what they were thinking to what he wanted to tell them. That, this idea of putting the old into new, and and I, I can see where that I can see where you thought that uh, this kind of goes against what they taught. No, I mean, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? That was thirty. Yeah. Jesus answered them, "It is not the healthy we need a doctor, but the sick." Mm -hmm. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay. I haven't gotten to food yet. <laughs> we jump down here. The next thing, they, they, whoever delighted it here, I, I think it goes together. It's like you got to read the front and the back. He's making. He's making a. He's making a point. Right. Right. That he's doing it different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't. You, you've got. If you're going to do the new, you've got to put the old behind you. And, and ergo, when you when you when you develop your faith to where you believe in Jesus, and you become a Christian, you're doing it different. Mm -hmm. You're not doing what you did before. And, and you and we can see this in, in a lot of the um, in a lot of the denominations that are out there right now. 
that they want to incorporate the Old Testament. And, and there, there's, there's a difference. There, there is a, 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 almost a black and white difference. And if you go and you look at church history, a lot of the heretics um, were those that split the Bible. You know, the Old Testament was this, and the New Testament is this. And they, to the point that there's two gods, there was the God of the Old Testament, which was a vengeful, wrathful God, and the God of the New Testament, which is a loving, compassionate, graceful God. And so, and they were like, no, there's only one God, so you're out of here. You know, you're a heretic. But you can see that from the very beginning, there was this notice of the difference in what Jesus is preaching versus what the Old Testament taught. And I think that but, that's what you're, that's that's what what you're saying, getting at. But we can't, we can't take this out of context. Jesus, later on, or before, I can't remember, says every word in the Old Testament mm -hmm. is true. He says that. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, I'm building this on the Old Testament. But you got to rethink it. Don't put it in the old wineskin. That's your thinking. This is how you were taught. Don't. I'm teaching a different. But you don't throw out the old. You just throw out the wineskin. Throw out the what? The wineskin. That, that's what. That's what the, the yeah. The, par the parable. The parable says you don't. You don't. Uh, uh, if if they do, uh, let's say, uh, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. If they did the. Uh, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. um, right. And then you, people do not put pour new wine into old wine skin because when it ferments and, and starts to, it'll swell up the bag and burst the bag. So you put new wines in new wine skin so when it swells up, of course it's new, it'll scratch and so, but, so, but it's you're still putting wine in it, <laughs> and no one and none of you, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for you say old is better. Wow, yeah, I know. What is he saying there? The old testament's okay, yeah. Well, no, he's saying that that when you drink the, the old wine. You, you won't want to go to the new wine because you're comfortable with what you have. Yeah. This is what you have, even though the new might be better for you. But you want to prefer the old because that's what you're accustomed to. In other words, you, you're set in your ways, and, and when the new comes, you, you're not going to accept it. Or this is a flag in the snow. When you come to it, think, well, the new's good. I'm not going to get trapped in the old. Um, I'll, 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 I'll think it through. There you go, yeah. Which we have to do because often Christians don't read the Old Testament. Okay. And, Absolutely. And I, I just got to my note. I got. I was on the top of my notes. My, my note here was, does this parable relate to the question of fasting? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so so he kind of he kind of like changed. You know, they come to him asking him, and he gives them a, a kind of a, you know, hey, how can they fast when I'm here? When I'm gone, they're going to have, you know, they're going to be mournful. And, and then he goes in and tells this parable, which is more about the teaching that he's bringing, this new teaching that he's bringing, versus what the old teaching was. Remember, the old teaching was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know. It, to, to the point of, if you had an accident... So, so we get in an accident, and you crash, and you kill somebody in a car. Guess what? The rest of that family had the right to take your life. But you can go to a sanctuary. But you could go to a sanctuary city where you would be able to live in that city. As long as you lived in that city, they couldn't harm you. But if you were to leave that city, they could go hunt you down and, and take your life for the life that you took, even though it was an accident. You can arrange a payment to the oh, yeah. family, yeah, and yeah. that'll get out of it. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like the mafia in New York. <laughs> but but the point Similar. is, but but the the point well, is, um, that's the old 
that's the old belt. That's that's the eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, life for life kind of mentality that comes out of the Old Testament, kind of set, setting the law, and the law strict to where what Jesus is teaching, he's teaching a compassion. You know, it was an accident. This person probably feels bad about what they've done already. Have compassion. Compassion on both sides. You should have compassion for that family that you, you know, had the accident with. But so so this new this new teaching, it's not it's not um, it's about yourself, the inner person. And you kind of see that in this this idea of the, the wine and the wineskin, right? The inner part is new, and it's going to tear apart the old. Do you know? Do you, do you know this here? Did you know that a lot of Seventh Day Adventists? Why do they call themselves Seventh Day Adventists? I don't know. Because they celebrate the Sabbath. On Saturday. On Saturday. Yeah. Saturday is the Sabbath day. So they don't recognize the New Testament as we move to the to the first day, the day of the resurrection, which was on a Sunday. And they don't recognize. And in Acts it says they gather together on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, not Monday, like everybody thinks. But but so but they go back to that. They also Hold to a lot of the dietary restrictions. <coughs> no pork, no whatever. <coughs> they don't eat pork. They don't eat shellfish. So, so why would they do that? When, when, um, as as Gentiles as we are, we were set free to, to <coughs> sexual immorality. Do not eat the blood of strangled animals. Yeah. So. I don't think we should stretch this thing too far. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think it, it seems like the devil can quote scripture. It seems it's part of it. You can can I share a tidbit with you? Sure. I, I interjected something before. I want to clarify. Do you know in New York and the mafia, there was an accident, and one of the big, big cheeses, his grandson, was run over and accidentally killed. Of course, the police looked at the thing and they said it was an accident. Everybody peaceful and quiet. <laughs> what the family did not accept that. The guy who was doing the driving disappeared. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> there was there was not a couple years ago, I, I say a couple years, could have been longer, maybe ten actually, where uh, a guy was driving in a neighborhood, he wasn't speeding or anything, but a little four year old kid run out in front of him and hit the kid and killed the kid. And the parents and the neighbors dragged the man out of the car and beat him to death. And it's like, how was that his fault? But yet, that, that, I'm getting into my sermon now <laughs> for a little bit later about mob, you know, this mob. And that's how they think. Uh huh. And there's no rationalization. You know, you took my child. I'll take you. Exactly. And, and that's where we get that. And I know we're kind of beating a dead horse here right now, but that's the idea. The Old Testament way versus this new way of, of love and compassion. I just, just want to make a point. Our interpretation, well, Christ, when Christ came, he gave us a message of love as opposed to the message of the Old Testament which was there was a system to make everything right. There was a way to make balance everything out. Well, Christ said, yeah, there is, but it's love. It's not, it's not fisticuffs. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's very important that we, we don't condemn the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They didn't have Christ's well, message. Well, they had God's message, but they, they implemented it a little differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, this book, this room's full of, of books on... on Jewish belief, which is Old Testament, the Jewish Old Testament, and um, I don't think there's any reason to say that that's wrong and this is right. He's saying I'm different. Yeah, I think I think the thing that the I think that going back to the um, 
the um, parable of the Good Samaritan. It, it, it kind of it kind of shows you how Jesus's teaching is it, it, it it's this idea of the law and the prophets is fulfilled in love. This idea of love. And if you look at the Good Samaritan, the first person that goes by is a priest, right? And, of course, in his capacity of doing the law, keeping the law, if he goes over to this person that's beat up and that person's dead, he just made himself unclean. And so he won't be able to fulfill his duty within the law. The same with the Levite that goes in. He doesn't go over and help the person because... If he does, he will make himself unclean in the law. And therefore, you know, you got to go through purification. The law, the law, the law. Okay. So who, who goes over and helps the person? Samaritan. Who is, they, they think is unclean anyway. And they don't, and, but he goes over and he asks, the, and Jesus asks the question, who was the neighbor to that man? Right? And so that's the point. The Old Testament tells us we, can, we have to do this and this and this. What Jesus is saying is sometimes to be a human being, you have to set the law aside and be a human being, which is more important than the law. And when I say be a human being, I'm talking about taking care of other human beings. And, and, and it, he, does, he says this several times throughout, you know, when, his, when he points out that... Um, his disciples, his disciples were picking the wheat on the Sabbath day. And he points out that David, when he was him and his men were hungry, they went and they ate the consecrated bread out of the and so he's you know he's pointing out that 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 idea is that this idea that this new teaching will destroy or burst open the the old ways if you if you if you don't put a balance to it. Well, he all gets back to the, to, 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 to the fact that God has put all of us on this earth, all, and that includes everybody who isn't a Christian, uh, all of us on this earth to care for his kingdom on earth. That's what we're here for. And to care for it is, is a very broad word. And you, you can care with love, you can care with discipline, you know, there's, there's other ways you can care, discipline yourself so that you care. May I ask the question, if you have concentrated, if the wafers and the bread is blessed and mm -hmm. it's sitting there mm -hmm. and you didn't use it all up, not enough people in the congregation, and there's a goblet with pure wine, Morgan, Morgan David or whatever, and you did, and there's plenty. Are you obligated as a priest or a pastor to finish it up, wipe it clean, and then gobble, 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 eat all? If I was Catholic or yes. Orthodox, yes. Yes. <laughs> but they believe in what's called transubstantiation, which means once you bless it, the wine becomes the actual body or blood of Christ, and the wafers or the, the bread becomes the actual body of Christ. So that's actual body and blood of Christ setting on the altar. So that makes them obligated to consume, consume it all. So when it's all over yes. and everybody goes home, there's a priest in the back room drunk as a skunk. No. No. no, no, no. It's not that much left. No, because, because there's, there's usually not that much left, no. one. Oh. And two, not only the... Not only the, the, the and mix of water. What, they mix it with water too. They well, they mix it with water too, and also a lot of times there's there's other people that will that are on the staff, the deacons, and that they will come forward, and they will do that after everything is done. So if you go to a Sabbath meal, on the Sabbath thing, what's the name? What's the name? Of the, uh, what do they call it? Passover? <clears throat> no, no, that way. Um, Seder. Seder. Yeah. If you do a Seder. Part of that is you got to drink four glasses of four, four glasses of wine. Right. I went to a seder in Israel, <laughs> and my host said, "Well, you got to have some wine." But I said, "I don't drink," and he said, "Tonight you do." <laughs> <laughs>
and I had the best wine of my life, the last I ever had, you know, a full glass of wine. But, <clears throat> yeah, nothing wrong with drinking. There, there, you know, and, and another thing, um, this is why if you go to, like Cindy and I went to, to Rome, and we took Mass. Um, we went to Mass with the first, very first um, Mass that, was it Benedict? Yeah. For, she she Benedict. actually had, had... The guy with, before with, Francis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, he, that was, this was his very first Mass he was doing. And uh, we come up... Uh, yeah, yeah. We come up out of the, the, the tunnel, and there's like barricades in the tunnel. The, the tube, the subway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> got to get my language straight. Over there, they call it the tube and the mm -hmm. underground. Anyway, so we come up out of there, and there's barricades everywhere, and these the carbonari, that's the Italian police, they're everywhere, and it's like, what's going on? And we walk a little bit further, and we see the big, we called it the Pope Tron, <laughs> big jumbotron, probably about as tall as this room and everything, and they had the Pope on there, and he was reading his, his homily. And so we went over there, and we sat and we watched, and and uh, at one point they they served mass. All these uh, priests come piling out of the the the, uh, the chapel that he was in. It was St. John's Chapel in, in Rome. Anyway, they come piling out, and they started patting, and they had the host, just the wafers. Yeah. They didn't have the food, and the reason why <coughs> is because. Could you imagine someone that wasn't a priest spilling the blood of Christ? That's why they hold it in their gift. That's exactly, that's why, right. they, that's why they, they it's always sip. the priest or someone that holds it and you, he, you either sip it or he dips it for you because, you know, that would be forbid, forbid that you would like spill the blood of Christ. And that's why you have the why the altar boy has that little plate. Yep, he's got the little plate to make sure that so in case there's a drip or a, a <clears throat> crumb or. Now, now I, I someone said this did, did this to me. I'm not going to name names or anything, but they spilled one of the um, some of the the wine that was left over, and they were like almost in tears. Mm -hmm. They were like, "What do we do? What do we do? Do I do I just get down on my hands and knees and, and drink it off the floor?" Your Catholics do it. That's come from a pack Catholic background. I said, I said, don't you worry about it. I'll take care of it. And I made them go in the other room while I went and got a paper towel and, and dabbed, dabbed it up. But but you can see that mindset, and that mindset comes from the idea that the wine and the and the wafer during the consecration um, becomes the actual blood. And body of Christ and that's called transubstantiation and that's one of the places where Catholics and, and Protestants differ well, so Martin Luther differed yeah Martin Luther but he was he was the I won't say he was the first but he was one of the, the biggest Protestant breakers so but anyway so so that that does that make sense that you see where we come what, where we believe there um, that's why I, I, I'm very careful when we do our communion. I call it our, um, what do I say? Consecration I, and transformation. Tra transformation and consecration. Now, for those that are of Catholic background, they see that transformation as tra transforming the blood and the body, the, the, you know, to the body. And, but it's more of a consecration. Just That means setting this apart. When you consecrate something, you're setting it apart for a purpose. And we're setting this, which is supposed to be bread and wine, the basic meal of the world. And so we're setting, but we're setting this apart to remember Christ. So, so you can see the, the difference there. Mm -hmm. and that's why we do that. It's transforming in us. As Protestants, it's transforming us, our spirituality, into that like Christ, uh, into one body, like like I like to say, into one body, the body of Christ. Um, for the for the Catholic background person, they're thinking of that transformation. So 
we're, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to include people and not exclude people. Does that make sense? Okay. We, we went, we went over a lot of stuff over something <laughs> that we probably shouldn't have taken. Are we so, still on here? Uh, yeah, we are. We're going to go ahead and we're going to head and go close it now. It's been what 30 minutes. What is the lesson for next time? Next week we're going to start at six eleven or one through eleven is where we're going to start. Six, six, chapter six, verses one through eleven, and then twelve through sixteen. I hopefully we can get into both of them. Get both of those. Six, one through eleven. One yeah. through eleven, and then we'll also do the the twelve apostles. He's naming the apostles. That's an interesting one. There's there's a lot there's a lot of stuff in that. Who, who, the, who the first apostles? Oh, excuse me. Okay, we got the Luke the, the apostles. What is that you're talking about? 